Our reading today comes from Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. A few weeks ago, it was Peter that made the announcement that Jesus was the Messiah, the Christ, but did not want to accept what it really meant. And that passage ended with this call to discipleship that we are to take up our cross and follow Christ. Today's text is similar in nature. The first half of Mark's gospel leads up to this declaration that Jesus is the Messiah. And the rest of the book is what that means. For now, Jesus is fully revealed. He is making his trek across the region to Jerusalem, to Gethsemane, to the cross. So let us give attention as Jesus once again foretells his death and then tells us how we are to live. In Mark chapter 9, verses 30 through 37. They went on from there and passed through Galilee. Jesus did not want anyone to know it, for he was teaching his disciples, saying to them, The Son of Man is to be betrayed into human hands, and they will kill him. And three days after being killed, he will rise again. But they did not understand what he was saying, and they were afraid to ask. When they came to Capernaum, And when he was in the house, he asked them, what are you arguing about on the way here? But they were silent. For on the way, they had been arguing with one another about who was the greatest. And Jesus sat down and called the twelve, and he said to them, whoever wants to be first must be last of all and servant of all. And then he took a little child and he put it among them. And taking it in his arms, he said, Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me. And whoever welcomes me welcomes not me, but the one who sent me. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Have you ever had those moments in your life when you've been afraid to ask a question. I mean, there could be many reasons that keep us silent. It could be out of pain. It could be out of worry. It could be out of a fear for disappointment. I know that, I mean, it may be an idea that, you know, you see something that you really want, but the last thing you want to do is ask the price because you like just seeing it and thinking about it and being like, well, that's a possibility. And then you find out that, no, it's really not. It's not either worth that possibly, and and your dream may just be shattered. So you just stay kind of quiet. Or sometimes I think we keep quiet because we don't want anybody to know what we don't know. I, I went through this a lot over the years. There were, there were times when, especially early in my seminary career, where they would use those big seminary words like pneumatology or, or pedagogy or pericope, and I'd smile and nod like I knew what they were saying. I, I know what they mean now. But I, I didn't want to seem like I was lacking in any certain way. But there's times that we do that and it keeps us from growing, because we decide that we're just going to turn ourselves in. And when we do that, we, we miss those opportunities to really experience new things fully. And our passage today being with once again with Jesus telling his disciples, there's some rough stuff coming ahead, that he's going to be betrayed and killed, and and then I'll rise from the grave. And the disciples hear these words of Jesus, and it's crickets. The disciples in Mark were fairly normal for asking questions and then being chastised for it because they had absolutely no point or clue what Jesus was talking about. But now, they just don't even want to 
talk about it at all. And maybe it's because they just want to like, change the subject because the last time that Jesus talked about him dying and one of the disciples said something, Jesus called him Satan. So maybe they just thought, I'm just going to shut up and sit this one out. But instead they, they think, well, maybe we should just change the topic. Which one of us do you think is the best? And, you know, you can imagine that that is probably James, Peter, and John are, are there thinking, well, it's obviously me. I mean, I mean... Whoever talks about some of those other disciples. I mean, the ones that we can barely even name. I mean, I mean, they're not the greatest. It's probably one of those big three. You know, the ones that go with Jesus all the time, that, that, that inner circle almost. And they're probably thinking, well, you know, I'm sure I'm the best. And then Jesus, as he goes along the way, he hears the grumbles and the background, and, and he calls them out because... He's like, it's probably just shouldn't stay silent and in the back, and we need to discuss it. And once again, the disciples respond with fear and silence. Maybe it was shame. And that's when Jesus realizes that they just haven't got the point. So Jesus spells it out to him, and he scoops up that little child into his arms, and he says, this is what it means to be great. He shows them this example of complete and utter vulnerability and says, this is the greatest thing in the kingdom of heaven. He meets them there in their worry, in their silence, in their fear, when they're confused and distracted, when they were unable to move forward. And that fearful silence is not just a problem that the disciples have. It's one that we face every day. Because we hear about the worries in the world. whether it's the violence that spreads out in our nightly news, locally, across our country, across the globe, when it's not just violence, but those issues of weather and devastation, and we're bombarded where we just wonder, what can we do? So we do what's the easiest. We just keep silent. And that's how often these fears and problems are dealt with, with silence. Or we do what we can to argue about something else. But we have those rough times in our life. And all too often the church struggles to address it. But we have those issues in our lives, in our families, in our homes, where we're dealing with illness and we don't know what's going to happen next. I mean, maybe somebody's been diagnosed with a disease that there's not really a cure for. And we know that as the days or the months progress, life's going to get difficult. We know or we have friends that deal with issues of unemployment or divorce or anger or addiction. And a lot of times we wonder, what can we do? And sometimes we come to the church and we wonder, what can we do? And the most comfortable thing is to be silent. Because we wonder, what can we say to help? How can we give a message of God's grace and love in those times of trial? How can we break the fear 
of our silence. And we have those issues every day. And we wonder, what can we do to move on? Just in Auburn, there are hundreds of people that are homeless. I know because I've, I and a few members of the congregation have made sandwiches for them every Friday and delivered them to them. And you go in there and there, there's these hotel rooms that have five, six people in a live it has, has, has mom and dad and three or four children. And if you've been in a hotel room, you know how full that is. And then we have opportunities to build shelters and nobody wants it in their neighborhood. And I understand that, too. Because it does bring in worries of crime and property values and, and things that, that, you know, probably are not as important as making sure that somebody has a house, but are important. So how do we respond to those things? How do we respond to those issues in our lives that are so difficult to deal with? We do what we can to follow Christ who takes a child, a helpless young child, and gives them worth and gives them value. Christ tells us to welcome the child in our midst, and in doing so, we welcome Jesus and we welcome God within us. And it's easy if we do it that way. I mean, we, get, we have the joy of baptizing a sweet little baby here in a little while, and that part's easy, because who doesn't love to welcome a sweet little baby? But what about when that child gets a little bit old and gets a little bit angry or gets a little bit in need of discipline or gets a little bit different when they're not that sweet little child anymore but maybe that person that cuts you off as you're driving to work or school. Or that person you heard say something just so horrible. That one that doesn't possess no longer that childlike innocence that we like to bring into, but maybe that one that's fallen in with the wrong crowd or has been damaged by addiction or drugs. Or How do we accept that child? Are we as quick to accept the child that's lived in the world we've made as much as we are as the child that's been born into it recently? So what do we do? What do we do if they're not Christian? Or they're not American? And that's the acceptance and welcome that Jesus is trying to say. He says, whenever you welcome this child that's not like you, that can't do anything for you, you welcome me. Whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me and whoever sent me. As I mentioned, we have the joyous blessing of the sacrament of baptism today. And with it comes vows that Craig and Stephanie will take on behalf of their child as Charlotte's parents. And there is this promise that it will also be asked of each and every one of you. And sometimes I don't know, I think we get so used to those that we don't remember. But it says, as members of the church of Jesus Christ, do you promise to guide and to nurture Charlotte by word and deed with love and prayer, encouraging her to know and to follow Christ and to be a faithful member of his church? And during this time, we're called to remember what these vows have looked like for all those years that we've set them or heard them, maybe as we were a parent holding our baby up here and we looked out into the congregation, into that holy family that we would see. Maybe 
It might be a calling back to remember those things we can't remember. When a congregation said that for us, when we were that child, when we were the child that was welcomed into the church, a child welcomed so that we could welcome Jesus and the one who sent him. And so that they are welcome within us. So let us always welcome the children regardless of their age or where they've been, know you are welcome. Know you have a home. Know you have a group of people that will look out for you and love you and care for you. Because that is the church. For we are servants of all. This is our calling to go and to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen.